Hello, the German astronomer Johannes Kepler is widely regarded as one of the greatest scientists of all time. Born in 1571, his work laid the foundations for the breakthrough that Isaac Newton made a century later. Kepler conducted research in the field of optics and made important advances in mathematics. He became imperial mathematician of the Holy Roman Emperor, but his most significant achievement was his development of his three pioneering laws of planetary motion, which revolutionised our understanding of the solar system. He accomplished all this despite the fact that he had little money, his personal life was hit by tragedy, his mother was accused of witchcraft, and he was a Lutheran at a time when an increasingly Catholic Germany often persecuted Lutherans. He's also thought to have written one of the first works of science fiction. With me to discuss Johannes Kepler's life and science are David Wooten, Professor of History at the University of York, Eulinka Rublak, Professor of Early Modern European History at the University of Cambridge and Fellow of St John's College, and Adam Mosley, Associate Professor in the Department of History at Swansea University. Adam Mosley, religion played a major role in Kepler's life, as it did in the lives of many people at that time. What was the religious situation in Germany when Kepler was growing up? So what we think of as Germany was, at that point, the Holy Roman Empire, which was a, a network of principalities uh, and little states and prince bishoprics that was nominally ruled over by the Habsburg Emperor. And it had been riven by the Reformation. So um, that had generated religious conflict and it generated uh, military conflict, which had come to an uneasy truce in the Peace of Augsburg in 1555. One of uh, the, the principles of that settlement was the... Uh, the cuius regio eius religio uh, principle, whose region, his religion. In other words, the, the territorial prince of a particular principality could say whether uh, that principality was going to be Catholic or Lutheran. Um, there were also free imperial cities. Kepler was born in one of those imperial cities, Waldestadt. So that was, uh, uh, in theory, that was mixed Catholic and Lutheran. But Waldestadt was, was embedded within the, the Duchy of Württemberg, which was a Lutheran duchy. And Kepler was Lutheran. Uh, he was brought up in, in a largely Lutheran environment. Kepler had opportunities, actually, um, because he uh, was bright. Uh, he was a good candidate for a scholarship, which, which was set up in order to train Lutheran pastors who in turn could educate the populace uh, as to what it meant to be a good good Lutheran. So you're saying he got a scholarship. Where to? What did it do for him? So he got a scholarship which, uh, which uh, was ultimately going to train him in theology at the University of Tübingen. What was his family background? He was born into a family that was, in a sense, on its way down. Um, so uh, in its heyday in the 15th century, uh, he, uh, his paternal... Um, ancestors had been uh, minor nobles. They had been uh, knighted through imperial service. But the family had moved into uh, the, the crafts and trades. His grandfather was quite well respected in Waldstadt. He was mayor. But his father was perhaps a little more restless, uh, a little more feckless, and he became a mercenary and was absent for a lot of, of Kepler's childhood, in fact. So the mother kept the place going? The mother was very important, uh, and the grandfather too, in, in keeping the family together. Eulinger, what was the difference? Can you just give us some idea of the differences between Catholicism, Lutheranism and Calvinism? For this program, Calvinism isn't particularly important, but, but Catholicism certainly is, and Lutheranism. What are the differences? What opportunities would be? What could he have? With, well, you tell us what the differences are and what opportunities were given and denied. So Lutherans think that uh, the papacy should not be the head of the church. Um, uh, they think that Christ alone should be the head of the church. They don't believe in good works either. And uh, Kepler certainly supported that. Um, they think that uh, believers are empty-handed before God. That means they affirm, and so do Calvinists, the notion that after the fall and the expulsion from paradise, humanity is uh, fundamentally depraved. In fact, uh, human nature is so depraved that there's nothing that you can do in your own life to right yourself. And that's why you're completely dependent on the grace of God. Uh, and he's granted that through the death of uh, his son, uh, Christ. And if you believe in that, then you can believe in your own salvation. And alongside that, uh, so this denial that there are good works um, is also, of course, the idea that uh, celibacy is not uh, a way of life. Uh, human nature is uh, sexual. Uh, 
sexual and and therefore are marred by that sin, but you have to affirm it and affirm family life. And uh, there are other beliefs about the Eucharist, so the idea that it's not the priest um, uh, who um, uh, transsumptuates the, the, the matter of, of um, uh, the Eucharist, it's uh, uh, there in the material. I mean, Luther says um, the Bible insists that this is my body and so I must believe it. And and that at the time is so important because the Eucharist is the ritual of salvation and it's given in both kinds um, uh, to all believers. And he took this completely seriously? Well, he takes it uh, seriously, but uh, the, the key to understand Kepler is to look at the complexity of his personality. So he tells us um, uh, that already as a teenager, so very early on, just as he gets that scholarship uh, uh, and makes his way into that Lutheran boarding school in Württemberg, he is very interested in the most complicated riddles and the most complicated prose. And of course, he thinks about the difference in uh, in Protestantism. So apparently he tells us he writes to the University of, of Tübingen, age 13, to ask about predestination, so the idea that you might be elect by God and might be already decided whether you're amongst um, the elect or not that go into heaven. And he is also always very, uh, very troubled by that idea of uh, the Eucharist, of the communion, the ubiquity um, of Christ, because if you think that really materially uh, Christ is present, well, then he would have to be everywhere. And um, and Kepler has to find for himself a different answer to to that um, to that question. What was his? How did he? What was his, his original name? He was sent to this place to become a pastor, a Lutheran pastor. He came out as a mathematician. How did he go from there to becoming a man who went into science? Yeah, in many ways, that is a, um, a somewhat an accident and and, um, and uh, a surprise. So just before he finishes his degree, he receives a letter with an invitation to become a math teacher in Graz, um, in Austria, uh, and that is a math teacher at a Protestant school for aristocratic sons. And he hums and hauls about this, and he's really been set up to be uh, a pastor and talks to his family, talks to his teachers, and then decides to go uh, for it for two reasons. Um, the first reason is that he always felt that he didn't have the right body to be a pastor. As a pastor, you're meant to be bulky and bearded, and he's inherited his mother's body. He's very slight. Um, he's short. At a student play in Tübingen on the market square once, he's cast as Mary Maudlin, and on top of everything, he catches a cold. So, you know, he hasn't got, he always feels he's got a scholar's body, not a pastor's body. But also, more fundamentally, he's already aware of the fact that to be a pastor means to engage in this endless confessional polemics between Lutherans and Calvinists. And he's heard that in sermons ever since he's a child. And he's really offended by it. And he doesn't want to become that man. So becoming a scientist um, means that he can become a theologian in a way, a thinker about natural philosophy, about the book of nature. And for him, that's a much more satisfying uh, uh, career. How does moving Austria to teach maths helping on that? Well, I mean, you might think at first it, it actually might might not. Um, it doesn't start very successfully. So we know that he's got hardly anyone sitting in his lessons. It's a complete disaster. Uh, what he uh, does and spends time doing is, is making calendars, um, astrological calendars that are more successful. But meanwhile, and that's an enormous leap, he becomes tremendously ambitious. And so he enters Graz age 23. Within a few years, he's put together this book um, that claims to explain the mystery of the universe. And from then on, he sees himself as a prophet who is the first one, eventually, he claims, to understand fully God's buildings plans. Through geometry? In part through geometry, yes. Yeah. David Wooden, can you give us an outline of the general view of what people thought of the universe at the time that Kepler was uh, growing up and then... Growing up and then going to teach. <clears throat> yeah. For 2,500 years, everyone has assumed that the Earth is stationary at the center of the universe. The heavens turn around the universe, around the Earth. The sun goes around the Earth. The planets go around the Earth. Indeed, the sun and the moon are planets that go around the Earth. Copernicus changes that in that Copernicus argues that the Earth and the moon going around the Earth go around the sun. 
Copernicus shares the assumption that have been there for 2,500 years, that movement in the heavens is circular, it's mathematically regular, it's constant, it's unchanging. And he certainly doesn't question the view that these great bodies moving through the sky are carried in transparent orbs, that there's a physical solidity to the heavens and that it's all driven from the outside. Mechanic, it's, a mecha it's a mechanical mechanistic, system yeah. driven from the outside. What happens in 1572 is uh, Tycho Brahe sees a new star where there shouldn't be a new star because change in the heavens, according to Aristotle and according to the whole tradition of astronomy, is impossible. The heavens carry on doing the same thing over and over again. And then Tycho Brahe also sees in 1577 a comet which he argues is cutting through the mechanism, the orbs, the transparent structure of the universe, in which case there isn't a mechanism there. Space becomes, in some sense, empty for the first time. So that Kepler inherits a question about what is out there within this structure of the universe. Um, what was the key motive? You've almost, some, you almost said it, that he thinks he the first, the first person to understand um, God's purpose in, in the universe. Was that the great motivating force? The crucial thing to see here, I think, is that for, for, for Kepler, God is the architect of the universe. Nothing can be random. God doesn't play dice. God doesn't throw things out randomly. Everything has to have a design structure, and that structure has to be beautiful, and beautiful for him means mathematical. So underlying the universe, there has to be a mathematical structure which nobody has understood. And what he claims in his first book, The Mystery of the Universe, is that he has grasped the mathematical structure of the universe for the first time. And what he's understood is why there are only six planets in the Copernican system, the Earth has stopped being a planet, uh, why the spaces between the planets are what they are. And that's because God, when he constructed the universe, built into it the spaces that you would have if you put between each planetary orbit orbit is a new word that Kepler invents, between each planetary orbit, a what's called a platonic regular solid. And there are five platonic solids, and they, n in God's mind, you fill up the space that. between You're going to tell us what those five platonic solids are, Dad. You can't get away with it. Uh, the simplest platonic solid consists of three, uh, of four isosceles triangles fitted together to make uh, a sort of pyramid. Yeah. The next one is the cube uh, with six sides. Then there's one with eight sides, there's one with 12 sides, and there's one with 20 sides. And those are the five platonic solids. Kepler's working within the notion that the orbits of the planets are spherical, and he wants to place these, the, he wants to nest these solids into the orbits. And that explains what the spacing of the orbits is. So he's seen into the mind of God. Geometry enables you to understand how God sees the universe. Adam, Adam Mosley, can you bring in the influence that the Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe had on Kepler? Sure. This well, is before the, the uh, invention of the telescope and its, its application to the heavens uh, in astronomy. Tycho Brahe is the preeminent observational astronomer of the 16th century, and he, with the support of the Danish crown, builds an observatory and um, constructs a range of instruments that allow him to observe the heavens with great, unprecedented accuracy. That's partly because um, Tycho, in, in common with other Lutheran astronomers, sees the study of the heavens as important, sees astrology as an important tool for understanding God's providential governance of the universe, and is therefore committed to an observational reform of astronomy and astrology in order to be able to, to, to understand God's plan for the universe better. Tycho Brahe is not a Copernican. Tycho Brahe elaborates his own system for the world, uh, which is a geoheliocentric system. So he believes the planets circle the sun, the sun circles the earth. So he keeps the earth at the center of the universe. Um, towards the end of his career, uh, Tycho Brahe falls out with the Danish crown, and he migrates. And he migrates uh, at, from Denmark eventually to Prague, where he's appointed imperial mathematician by Emperor Rudolf II. Uh, Kepler knows a little bit about Tycho Brahe at the point uh, in his life when he's, he's producing his first book on the, uh, the secret of the universe. He knows about that because his, his mathematical mentor in Tübingen, Michael Messler, is one of Tycho Brahe's correspondents. So they've been exchanging letters. Messler's also seen some of Tycho Brahe's publications that have not yet made it generally into the open market. So Kepler includes some mention of Tycho Brahe in his first book. He's very keen to know what Tycho Brahe makes of that work, and so he, he initiates a correspondence. 
with him. Yulinka, Yulinka Rublak, when he's in contact with these people, this teaching, is he still held back in any way by being a Lutheran? We're, we're, the Catholics are gaining force in, the, in Germany at that time. What, does he have problems with that? Well, he uh, never has a university position. Um, because he's not allowed one. That is right. So he's in Graz uh, very quickly in a terrible situation. As a 27-year-old, he's married uh, by then. And in Austria, there's militant counter-reformation. So Cath books are burned, Catholic, Catholic yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah. And he writes desperate letters back to Tübingen to his teacher, Michael Mestlin, who just mentioned. And it's clear that um, Mestlin just doesn't respond. He's not helping him at all. Um, so Tico Bry really um, the move to Prague. I mean, by then they've collaborated. is is fundamental for him, and he's so lucky to uh, be appointed there. Um, he tries, nonetheless, all his life. Um, we associate him very much and with with Prague. All his life, he tries to get back to Württemberg, uh, to his home territory in Germany, that is Lutheran. Uh, but it's decided very quickly by the theologians there that this is an unreliable man who can confuse the young with his doubts about, uh, in particular, this question of the Eucharist, where he's leaning to more towards a Calvinist stance, uh, and that ruins his prospects um, to ever have the security of a university uh, position and the salary that comes with it. David Wooten, um, you've, you've mentioned this, you've talked about this, and you've given us the five platonic solids, platonic solids which none of us will ever forget, uh, the reference forever. And you've talked about his first major work, um, The Secret of the Universe. Can you talk more about it? What Kepler is trying to do is construct a universe in which bodies move through space. And so he asks a question that nobody has asked before, which is, what's moving them? Now, in the old system, there are these uh, transparent orbs, which are mechanically driven, as it were, by some divine force. Take that away, and bodies are traveling through space. And the question then is, one way of putting the question is, how do they know where to go? Supposing they're at the planets have souls driving them, how does the soul know when to turn? how to turn. And particularly what Kepler does is he does a drawing which shows how under the Ptolemaic system the very complicated spirals that planets have to move through the heavens. And the question is, how do you know to turn here when there's no marker there? And Kepler's answer to that is there has to be a physical interpretation of this process and it has to be one that's, as it were, realistic. It has to either be that they can navigate they have markers that enable them to navigate, or there has to be some comprehensible force driving them. And from very early on, Kepler's convinced that this force emanates from the sun and that this force must be thought of as being something like magnetism, which can operate over a distance. So he's trying to build a model of the universe where the sun is driving the planets through the heavens and the force that's emanating from the sun is a bit like a magnetic force and that this is acting on the planets and pushing them along. He's got no concept of inertia. Uh, it comes, Galileo begins to get a concept of inertia. Inertia enables you to think the planets will just float along through space. On the contrary, for Kepler, they have to be pushed all the time. Some force has to be constantly preventing them from coming to a halt. Can we move on to these uh, laws of planetary motion? And can you tell us about the first two, first and second, Adam? So um, what we think of as Kepler's uh, first two laws of planetary motion are expressed in his New Astronomy of 1609. Um, in his what? His New Astronomy, right. a, a publication of his of 1609, um, which has a longer title, which in, invokes physical causes, celestial causes, which is something relatively new in astronomical works of this period because of a traditional distinction between doing astronomy, mathematical modeling of the heavens, and thinking about physical forces. So what we think of as his first law was actually the second, the second one he arrived at, but that's the law that says that planets move in ellipses, not circles, and that the uh, sun is, at, uh, is um, at one of the two foci of the ellipse. You're looking as if you might want me to explain that. Uh, I'm just looking inquiringly. Uh, and you, you, take, you read it as you want. If you want to explain, explain away. Okay. So, um, so an ellipse is, uh, is an, we can think of it as, a, as an oval with two axes of symmetry. So it's, a, it's an elongated circuit like, so it has a long axis and a short axis. It's symmetrical about both of those. Um, and the, 
the two foci um, lie on the long axis and they're part of how a mathematician would uh, define a particular ellipse. And if you take any point on the, uh, on the ellipse and you draw a line from that point to these two points, um, the sum of those two lines is always the same length and it's always the, the long axis of the ellipse. So what's important here for Kepler is that, it, I mean, he has a long struggle. He, he arrives at this, this discovery through his work on the planet of Mars, which is the task, calculating the, the planetary motion of Mars is the task that Tycho Brahe sets him when he first arrives in, in Prague. And through a long struggle, Kepler arrives at an ellipse for the, for the orbit of Mars because he, he works with circles, he works with ovals, and none of them agree to, uh, with Tycho Brahe's observations, to the degree of accuracy that Kepler's convinced those observations relate to. Julian, can, can we take that on, the planetary motion, and also talk about the circumstances, which are quite important, in which he's finding himself at this time. He's having, he's got very little money, his first wife's died, leaving him a lot of children, some of them have died, marriage again, more children, more poverty, and so on, and doing this work. Can you give us some, some idea of how planetary motion is going on with a, a, a frantic, as it were, in terms of getting some money in family life? Yeah, it's one of the astonishing and really inspiring features of, of uh, Kepler's life, how he manages to uh, keep doing breakthrough research, as we would call it nowadays, um, while his circumstances are so problematic. So meanwhile, he's had to leave uh, Prague in 1612 uh, when the Counter-Reformation progresses there. Uh, his wife, as you say, has died. He's got these children. He's got a park somewhere and then finds a position in Linz and brings them back there. Um, he hasn't even got access to a printing uh, press very easily. He's got to buy himself paper to get all this organized. We think often that uh, print make, made everything possible. It was actually incredibly hard for someone even like Kepler uh, to um, uh, to uh, put his ideas in, into print and find money for it. Um, uh, when he writes The Harmony of the World, moreover, which is published in uh, 1619, um, uh, we move into the period period where his mother is accused of witchcraft and he actually has to shelter her at home uh, uh, for uh, some time. So um, uh, you couldn't really imagine more difficult circumstances. But another feature of Kepler's um, personality, which we haven't touched on so far, is that he's tremendously optimistic. He's inspired and kind of fired on by the sense that we're, uh, he's living in an amazing time of the new science in a way of new constellations new heavenly constellations of a God also uh, who still creates um, and that uh, makes him very different from much of the tone of the time so he's uh, very offended by Lutherans who endlessly think in apocalyptic terms who think the world is coming to an end you know the stones look less brilliant than they did uh, the light is dimming, everything becomes more dark before the world ends. And he finds himself arguing from a completely different position. Um, and I think that that gave him the, the energy to carry on despite uh, his, his financial problems. But, you know, he gets in 1610 a letter from Galileo, which must have just enraged him. Galileo says, uh, look, um, I just, you must have worked with quite a mediocre observational instrument. Um, I've got amazing ones. I've just got a huge gift from the Duke of Tuscany. Uh, he gave me a, a, a lot of money uh, as a salary. Um, and I've got all the time in the world to carry on uh, with my work. So really this territorial uh, behavior um, and and um, his, his life is, is uh, completely different. He hasn't got money for instruments um, and he can't even travel to other places to make observations. Can we conclude the, the laws of planetary motion, David? We David can. Can. I mean, just to go back to this, I mean, Kepler is a man of principle. He has endless opportunities to sell out. He could have become an orthodox Lutheran and got a nice job in university. He could have converted to Catholicism and been showered with rewards. He insists on holding to his lonely, isolated position, unlike someone like Galileo, who's prepared to sell out any time you ask him to almost. Kepler accepts the consequences of refusing to fit in. He's a very exceptional, determined individual. Back to the laws of planetary motion. We did the first one, which is the ellipse. The, the second one is that uh, the area swept, if you imagine a line from the sun to a planet and the planet is going around the sun, the area swept out by 
the line as it moves around, as the planet goes around the sun, in any period of time, will be the same area. On Kep where you've got an ellipse, the planet is sometimes closer to the sun and sometimes further away from the sun. As it comes closer to the sun, it speeds up. As it moves further away from the sun, it slows down. And the law that governs the way in which it speeds up and slows down is Kepler's second law, which is that the area swept out between it and the sun will be the same in any period of time. And that gives you a way of calculating the, the, the speed of the planet around the sun. And the third law. The third law. The third law is the most difficult. Uh, the third law... Do you want to skip it? No, no, no. I'm determined to do it. You, you may get cut out of the program later. The third law is one which established... If you think of a, of a planet going around the sun in modern terms, if it goes too fast, it'll fly off into space. If it goes too slowly, it'll fall down into the sun. There's a right speed for every orbit. The third law is about that right speed. It says that if you take the the diameter of the orbit of the planet around the sun and uh, you cube it and you take the time the planet goes around the sun and you square it and you divide one into the other you will get a constant very simple terms if you take the diameter of the earth around the uh, of the earth's orbit around the sun and call that one you take the period that the earth takes to go around the sun and call that one one year you cube one square the other, divide them into each other, and you'll get one. Now, if you take those same units for all the orbits and do the same calculation, you'll always come up with one. And will you? Yeah, it's right. Adam, um, he was Kepler's most celebrated during his life for his Rudolphine tables. Right. So when Kepler first moved to Prague as Tycho Brahe's assistant, Tycho Brahe has been commissioned to produce these astronomical tables. Um, and uh, they take a long time to finish, and Kepler's the one who finishes them when they're, when they're eventually published in 1627, um, Tycho Brahe is still listed as the, the main author and Kepler is the one who's com completed the work. So astronomical tables are the tables that are um, uh, expressions of the mathematical models that you use for modelling the behaviour of the planet. And they're tables that allow you then to uh, determine the positions of the bodies in the heavens at any given moment in the future or indeed in the past. Um, so uh, there have been previous sets of tables. The, the tables that were used through the late Middle Ages were mostly the Alphonsine tables, named after King Alfonso X of Castile. Uh, then there are the Prutenic tables or Prussian tables produced in the mid-16th century. Kepler produces the Rudolphine tables that are much more accurate than these earlier tables because they're based on his uh, uh, Laws of motion, which are based on um, on the more accurate observations of Tycho Brahe. Um, these tables allow predictions for the first time, so predictions of the the transit of Mercury. So Mercury passing across the, the face of the Sun, uh, Kepler is able to predict that for 1631. He doesn't live to see that transit, and therefore live to see uh, this prediction come true. But it is observed by some other astronomers after his death. And uh, it's remarkable how close um, uh, uh, the tables are, the predictions are, in, in, uh, in the time of, of this event. Ulenka, in another world, which is coexisting, uh, his mother is accused of witchcraft, which is a very serious offence at that time. And uh, he uh, defends her in depth. Uh, he takes it very seriously, he examines all the evidence, he conducts a very long defense. Must have been curious, mustn't it? I mean, one minute he's talking about planetary motion and cubes and squares and whatnot, and then he's got to go back to his village or small town and defend his mother against accusations from another woman in the village for being a witch. What did he think of having to do that? Well, he, of course, when he gets uh, a letter from his sister in 1615 telling him that the mother is accused of witchcraft, he knows immediately that this um, is something he has to take so seriously because his whole reputation is at stake. Why if is you his were, reputation at stake? Well, if you were brought up by a witch, that meant that oh, you were brought up by someone who uh, was infused with the devil. Um, and that meant that you yourself were tainted by that. Um, so he takes it very seriously from the start, 
turns into a six year long process and he decides to take over the legal defense. Now, what's important is that there are actually real links between his scientific work and the way he conducts that defense. Um, the scientific world at the time is full of enmity and Kepler has perfected a way to deal with that. It's very fact orientated. So he's trained himself to not throw insults at other um, natural philosophers, as uh, we would think of them, and many of them do throw insults at each other. He's perfected a very fact oriented un mode of unpicking uh, uh, his opponent's arguments. And that's exactly why he insists that he must get all the, uh, uh, the trial documents on paper in writing and he dissects it brilliantly in just the same way he says this is inconsistent you know so in this witness says oh, my mother did this 15 years ago and that's also far too long and the other one says this was seven years ago so he treats it like a, a text and uh, that makes possible um, that she's not burnt. There's no doubt that if he hadn't um, if he hadn't taken over the defense she would have been burned as a witch so what effect did it have on him? Did it have an effect on him? It must have had an effect on him, so let's forget that. That would be terrible. What effect, if any, did it have on his work? Well, we can notice he, he literally, first of all, he has to put his whole uh, work on halt uh, for more than a year. He moves from Linz um, with his family back to Württemberg, to Germany, um, and can do, of course, much less work than he would have done. He um, returns then to Linz, um, has to unpack his boxes, and, and you can see that this otherwise... Uh, optimistic person is really quite traumatized. It takes him a while to uh, start writing letters to people again to take up his work. He's still troubled by that question, why of all people did this happen to us and to our family? Now we, we're in the last third of the program and there's an awful lot more he did besides astronomy. So David, what about the mathematics? Uh, you, you describe him as a brilliant mathematician. He's a great mathematician and he, astronomy is a, uh, a major professional enterprise, primarily in his world because it's linked to astrology. He, he's hired as the, as the, as the uh, imperial mathematician so that he will do horoscopes for the emperor. Pure math hardly exists in Kepler's world, but Kepler has the capacity to be a great pure mathematician and he identifies mathematical problems that continue to puzzle mathematicians. Um, he, for example, he make, makes a little study of the shapes which it is possible to cover a floor with, which are always repeated and leave no spaces. And there are only three of them, the triangle, the square, and the hexagon. And the hexagon, he shows how this runs through nature in the, in the, in the shapes of beehives and so on, be the cells of, of, of... And in that sense, what he's doing is showing how you can read patterns in, into nature. Um, he does uh, a analysis of the question of what's the most efficient way of stacking cannonballs. This is asked by Sir Walter Raleigh of the great English mathematician Harriet, and Harriet knows how to stack cannonballs, the same as stacking oranges, but he says to Kepler, why is this the right way? Actually, there are several different right ways that all work out roughly the same. Why is there no better way? And Kepler produces what's called Kepler's conjecture, which isn't proved to be true for 400 years. It was only proved to be true a few, uh, couple of decades ago, explaining what the limits are on the right ways of stacking cannonballs in order to maximize... So they couldn't the crack it for 400 years? They knew how to do it, but they didn't... The mathematicians are worried about why was this the case? It's a pure mathematical problem. Kepler also, when he, when he goes to Linz, I think it is, he sees these uh, great barrels with wine in it, and people measure how big the barrel is simply by taking the diagonal. And he says, but that, that can't be reliable, that can't be the right. So he, he does an analysis of the curve of the barrel and how you work out what the barrel, the size of the barrel, the volume of the barrel is. And this, of course, is related to the fact that he's working with ellipses in astronomy and he's got to do analyses of the areas within the ellipse in order to do his, his second law. So what he then does is work out the mathematics of this curve and this uh, leads on to uh, complicated mathematical questions about infinitesimals, which is the sort of problem that Newton works on later. Adam, now his study of optics. Yes. So Kepler, and he inherited a great body of work from the Arab world at this stage. Yes. So optics is a subject with a long-standing mathematical tradition, um, treating light geometrically. Um, Kepler publishes two important works on optics. And the first of these, it, it, one of its part of its title is the optical part of astronomy, because optics is very important for astronomy because you're observing the heavens, you're seeing visible objects. You need to understand how... Um, 
optical phenomena can affect your observations, particularly the accuracy that, that Kepler is working with following Tycho Brahe. Um, in that work, that first work um, published in, in 1604, Kepler's really interested in a range of optical phenomena, but the, the, the beginnings are really to do with what happens in eclipses and how you observe them. You can't observe the sun directly with the eye, so you project it through an aperture. How does the aperture affect what you see? Um, why is it that in eclipses the diameter of the moon appears to be different than at other points in its cycle? And from uh, working on those problems, related problems, Kepler moves on to actually study the human eye. And he works out, uh, for the first time, that the, uh, in the human eye, um, light projects an image um, onto the retina. He is the one who establishes that. And he does that through his study, geometrical study of light, but also through uh, drawing on the works of, of contemporary anatomists and thinking about the, the structure of the eye. There's a second uh, uh, important work in optics, the Dioptrics of 1611, which is partly in response to learning about the, the, the telescope used by Galileo. And in that, Kepler is studying two lens systems, such as you get in the telescope. He devises a new combination of lenses, two lenses, uh, to produce a telescope that generates an inverted image, unlike the, the, the telescope of Galileo. But astronomers don't care that the image is inverted. If the image is better, then uh, the, they don't mind that it's upside down because, because that's, uh, that's not important to their studies. And, and so Kepler invents this new kind of astronomical and this telescope. Is a, you're, this is a major move forward, is it, Robert? David, you're not, yeah. but it isn't yeah. enough on radio to know. No, but it's an improvement on all previous telescopes. And, and crucially, when, when Galileo produces his teles first telescopic observations, people say... They must be wrong. This is completely false. Somehow the telescope is creating this illusion. And what Kepler does is explain how the telescope works and therefore explain how it comes about that telescopic observations are reliable. And Kepler also has the extraordinary credit of when Galileo reports his discoveries with the telescope of immediately saying, I believe you. He's the first person to believe Galileo and to publish in Galileo's defense, even before he's seen it for himself, before he can get a telescope himself, which is good enough to see the things Galileo has seen. He wrote... Uh, something called somnium or the dream how does that fit into the uh, to the uh, pattern of his thinking the people said it's the first science fiction work but can you tell us what he, what he was trying to do there the somnium brings out a crucial aspect of his thinking, which we haven't touched on so far. So we've emphasized how he is interested in regularity and explaining causes that way. But another part of his thinking is uh, very much uh, attached to the notion of playfulness. Because he thinks of God as still creating as a playful creator, he thinks that God also speculates and tries things out and that parts of the creation are still unfinished. And in his own mind, I mean, part of him is a bit, you know, interested in regularity, but he can also become a bit bored by it because he's such a hyper intelligent um, uh, uh, thinker. So, and that means, for instance, clocks that are very elaborate at the time, they bore him because they're too regular. Um, and therefore, his own mind uh, is interested in science fiction. Uh, what would the Earth look like if seen from the moon? That is what the somnium, the dream is about. And that's why it's one of the first pieces of science fiction. And he wants to show how the people on the moon, say, what the inhabitants of the moon think that everything is fixed, just as many people on Earth think that everything is fixed. But in fact, everything is in motion. Um, and that is, is the point of the exercise. Um, but it links to the witchcraft trial then in very intriguing ways because uh, the science fiction part about the moon has a little prologue. And that is a, a story about a mother and the son. And the mother is a witch and the son is a scientist. And when he goes back to Linz, he unpacks his boxes and he finds his manuscript. And actually what he does for the next years is to annotate it, to say that none of this uh, is autobiographical. But he sort of convinces himself in this very traumatized way that it be was because his manuscript circulated that the people first started to think that his own mother could be a witch. That comes round in circle to kick him in the teeth, doesn't it, really? Yeah. That he was responsible. Well, that is, I mean, it's a guilt syndrome, yeah. a traumatised guilt you syndrome. Right? Because, you no, I don't think, um, no. I mean, he, he does have um, a suspicion of uh, it circulating, but I don't think he's right at all. Can we come to you finally, David, and please all join in, but 
Uh, you, you say in your notes that Kepler laid the foundation for Newton's work, uh, and that was his greatest legacy. Could you develop that? Uh, yes. I think, first of all, we've been talking about Kepler's three laws. They're not laws for Kepler. He doesn't use that word. That's a word that is introduced in the 18th century. They're not laws for Newton. What Kepler's uh, Rudolphine tables show, because he's baked the laws into the Rudolphine tables, is that this is how the universe appears to work, that if you use these laws, you get the right results. And in that sense, Newton inherits this, and he inherits that these are the principles on which mathematically you can explain, you can predict what's going to happen. What Newton then asks himself is, if these laws shape what's going to happen, what sort of force could be generating this sort of behavior? Kepler thought it was some sort of mathematical force being driven out by the sun. Newton introduces the concept of gravity to produce the results that Kepler has described. And what Newton does is show that if gravity works the way Newton claims gravity works, then Kepler's laws follow necessarily, that the universe has to be Kepler's universe. Did Newton re know about Kepler's work? And Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, Newton's a, 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 a wicked man, a monster. Yes. He does That's not refer to Kepler in Book One of the Principia. But when the, Royal, when the Principia is given to the Royal Society, they enter in their log books. This is a book demonstrating the truth of what Kepler has done. Everybody understands that what Newton has done is take Kepler and turn him from a description of the world into an explanation of the world. Olinka said earlier that Kepler wants to produce explanations. Well, in a sense, what Newton has done is complete Kepler's work by producing a superior explanation out of Kepler's work. It's a good place to finish. Thank you very much, David, David Wood, Adam Mosley, and Yulinka Rublik. Next week in our time, we'll be off the air, but we'll be back on January the 12th with Nietzsche's Genealogy of Morality. Thank you for listening. And the In Our Time podcast gets some extra time now with a few minutes of bonus material from Melvin and his guests. Well, go on then. What did we miss out? Olinka well, well, pointed to something that I, I, I had not understood before until I was reading up for this program. And, and it sort of thrilled me, though it's also complicated to talk about. When in the Somnium he asks, what does the Earth look like from the Moon? The whole of his astronomy is really based upon asking how does it... The problem in the Copernican system is the Sun is stationary, but the Earth is moving. You're, you're observing the universe from a moving platform. The question is, how do you eliminate that movement? How do you observe the universe from a, a, a fixed point? One place to look at it from is, is from the sun. Kepler devises extraordinary techniques for making measurements as if they were taken from the sun. He's, when he was working on the orbit of Mars, he has to somehow discount for the movement of the Earth. He does this brilliant thing where Mars goes around in an orbit every 635 or 643 days, whatever it is. He takes observation 643 days apart and says from these we can see how the earth would look from mars and so he calculates the earth's orbit by placing himself on mars and saying every 643 days mars is in exactly the same place how does the earth look from there and in that sense this capacity to move himself somewhere else and, and, and carry out a measurement that says if it's from somewhere else is the very foundation of his astronomy. And this has to be got in. Sorry, so. Kepler's ability to think outside the box is yeah. really um, astonishing. Uh, so the ellipse, if one thinks that the, the circle was this quiet, perfect, beautiful form, to think the ellipse yeah. before anyone has thought it, and as this very dynamic space, is one of the greatest achievements in the history of science. I think I, well, I did, I, I'm not qualified to say something like that, but it did seem extraordinary looking at how he got from there to there. Mm. When, and anybody else had any notion that it might be an ellipse? Well, I think the thing to bear in mind is that, is that um, for, for technical astronomers, mathematicians, they've been working with combinations of circles. So you can't get a circle just by itself to work, to model the planetary motion. So you have to, you have to build circles on circles. You have to have circles that are off-centre. And so, actually, some of the constructions that were already in use, if you, instead of, uh, if you take the resultant position of an epicycle on other circles, a circle moving on a circle, and you, you draw out that curve, then you end up with, with already uh, a, a shape that, that is not circular. So, so, in a sense, mathematicians have been working with different kinds of curves, but they hadn't, because, because Kepler was so motivated by the idea that there had to be an underlying geometry, and there had to be a related physical explanation. So he, he didn't want 
to produce motions just from combinations of circles because there's no there's no natural um, underpinning to that. He wanted to understand what was really physically going on. At the same time, this is a man who believes that the earth is alive, that it uh, is like a body, really, that is animate, that it's uh, belching and has winds. Uh, and that is what Galileo just finds ridiculous when he comments on it. Mm -hmm. um, he truly believes that in that form has that potential to, for ongoing uh, creation. Is also a man who uh, collects horoscopes and casts horoscopes, is intensely interested in astrology, uh, but moves away from... Uh, uh, from some of the uh, uh, given scholarly opinions about astrology. He learns how to cast horoscopes as a student in Tübing. It's part of the regular university uh, education at the time. Yeah, he really invents a new form of astrology because he, he dispenses with some of the old uh, things such as the, the zodiac and he emphasizes the geometrical relationship between planets. He comes up with new kinds of relationship that he thinks are significant, new aspects. And then he offers an explanation of how these, um, these relative planetary positions can have an effect on the Earth which, and on people on the Earth, which relates to the ability of the soul to recognize geometry. And one of the effects of the witchcraft trial is that he assumes that children are born under the same constellations as their parents and therefore share a lot with their parents. So he moves to something I would call social psychology because it pushes him to think so much harder about how he's different from his mother because he's got to argue that they're different. So in the harmony of the world, he actually has a whole uh, paragraph on how his mother is different. And he explains that, for instance, by saying, well, she's a woman, she doesn't have access to school education, as I had. And that is revolutionary. Uh, I mean, it's obvious to us today, but at the time, nobody has said that. I mean, in a way, there's an end to this man's curiosity and ability. He uh, made investigations into snowflakes, Adam. That's right. So he produced in 1611 a little uh, tract on the snowflake, snowflake as a New Year's gift. Um, and uh, the question for him really was, why are, why are snowflakes hexagonal? So he investigated that. Uh, he didn't have a very good answer, it turns out, in the end, but he explored um, packing crystal structures. And so this work is seen um, uh, very much as a, as a kind of early work in crystallography. But it brings out his ingenuity as a writer. He's in Prague. It's snowing. He looks at them and he thinks, why are they so regular? And he says, OK, I'm going to write this little pla a pamphlet trying to explain it for my, one of my best friends. Yeah. I mean, he's the first person to see that they're regular. I mean, yeah. you'd think there'd be snowflakes forever. He's the first person to recognize that they're regular. But also, it's a beautiful little thing because he's, he's worrying. I, I, he's got nothing to give to his friend. And then he gets this pun where, the, in German, the word for snow and the word for nothing are very similar. So he says, I'm going to give him snow, and snow will melt away and it'll be nothing. And in that sense, he turns a non-gift into a gift, this beautiful little gift. But, but as usual, there's, a, there's a, a serious point to his very playful side, because the friend that he gives his work to is, is an atomist, and Kepler isn't an atomist, and, and so Kepler, part of the point, therefore, is that, that atomism, which is about, you know, ultimately reducing things to their smallest point, that, 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 that this is not correct. And so his treatise is part of his, uh, his rebuke to his, his atomist friend. 